So with that, I want to uh, recognize uh, someone here who is a true innovator in every sense of the word, uh, Wendy Goldstein, who's standing to my right. I'm going to have her come to the podium in a minute. But she, um, she took a risk with a little company called Medsphere uh, probably four or five years ago. And um, she's a big academic medical center, uh, 476 beds, 670,000 outpatient visits a year, uh, 800 attending physicians. I don't know how many nurses, but close to that, if not more than that. And she wanted her community to get better clinically. And uh, given she, her, her marketplace is Brooklyn, New York, which is a very competitive marketplace, uh, she knew she had to do it with an out-of-the-box uh, out approach because the traditional approach wasn't going to work for her and her organization. So we have partnered with Wendy. I've been here four years. She made the decision before I certainly joined the company, and we've been partners in every uh, sense of the word. And as partners, sometimes we agree on things. Sometimes we don't agree, but we work it out in the end. Um, and I am so proud of the job that she and her team have done at Lutheran with virtual 100% CPOE. They're doing barcode medication administration now. She'll tell you about the clinical performance, I believe, that she has uh, developed. Now, before I get to the, before I uh, bring her up here, I just want to tell you this is one accomplished person. She probably operates in the toughest marketplace, among the toughest marketplaces in the United States, New York City. Uh, she's got quite a bit of experience. She was a director of Mount Sinai. She was in New York a University Medical Center. She's been a Memorial uh, Sloan Kettering Hospital in St. Luke's Roosevelt. These are all very large, complex, politically difficult environments to operate in, and she's always continued to rise to the top. So with that, I want to recognize Wendy Goldstein, the President and CEO of Luther Medical Center. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to sort of, where do I? turn the slides from. I'm very technologically advanced, as you can imagine. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, I've brought my uh, CIO, Steve Art, and my COO, uh, Claudia Kane, with me because really, more than anything else, this is a team effort. And uh, if you don't build the right team, there doesn't matter what product you got, it's not going to work. But in building that team, I think it's very important to think about your, the product and think about the company you're working with because this has been a partnership for us. Um, ups and downs for sure, but certainly a partnership. And for an institution like Lutheran, the partnership is critical. We're not part of a large system. 468 beds seems like a lot to a lot of you, but in New York, it doesn't even start to scratch the surface when you're talking about thousands of beds in systems, and that's who our competitors are. So when we make partnerships, it's very important that they be strategic partnerships. And one of those partnerships has been with Medsphere, and you'll see why. So let me see if I can do this. We are an unusual institution in that we, although we are a community hospital, we provide an, an, a, an, amor an enormous amount of uh, tertiary and very complex care. We're a level one trauma center, um, we're a stroke center, we're a STEMI center. So we've got ICU beds and NICU beds and all kinds of other stuff like that. Um, but the thing about Lutheran that's sort of interesting is that Lutheran Medical Center is part of a healthcare system that we have created. We have a very large federally qualified health center system, a network. Um, it's got over 50 sites in the five boroughs. So we're really spread out. When St. Vincent's Medical Center went bankrupt uh, and closed a couple of years ago, their homeless program, which was in four boroughs, was taken over by Lutheran. Um, so that we are really much more than just in Brooklyn at this point. We also have a nursing home, a 240-bed nursing home. 100 of those beds are subacute, and uh, they will be coming into the network. We also have 700 beds of subsidized senior housing that we work with the federal government on. And we've got a home care agency, a small licensed agency. So we really are a little network. Uh, and what we have done is to develop partnerships, strategic alliances, with a variety of institutions. So our cardiac program is with Mount Sinai, um, and our anesthesia program is with uh, uh, State University uh, Downstate. And each one of the, and Maimonides is with us on our behavioral health program. And our IT program is with Medsphere. That's the way we like to think about this. Um, Lutheran is a safety net institution. 
what that translates into is we ain't got no money. That's the bottom line. You know, it's, uh, we are not failing. I'm very proud of the fact. In fact, if any of you uh, read Cranes yesterday, you saw that we were, uh, we have our 1% margin in the black, which we're very proud of. Um, compared to what goes on with most of what happens in New York, that's, it's not too bad. But most of the safety net institutions in New York are in uh, the deficit situation, um, 10, 20 percent deficits a year. It's just extraordinary, especially in Brooklyn. So because of the challenge that we face uh, and the patients that we are serving, we have enormous amount of external regulation. 80% of our patients are publicly paid patients, 50% Medicaid, 30% Medicare. So the enormous amount of regulations growing and the ability to provide data on a very real-time basis that's very accurate is going to be critical, both in terms of our ability to manage going forward and to be comply with the, outside, uh, with the federal government and the state government. So our reimbursement is very, very tight. Um, whoops, back. There you go. Okay, so why did we do it? This is the reason we did it. This is an actual uh, order from one of our charts. Um, and we, we spent a good deal of time sort of guessing what it, anyone wanna guess what it is? Anybody? Come in, all right, so you, anyone want a job at Lutheran as a coder? Uh, yes, it's Coumadin. But uh, you could imagine that it's not something that, um, that we're particularly proud of in terms of what goes on. And this is reality. You have um, uh, a very international medical staff, a very international group of residents, and our patients um, uh, speak uh, predominantly six different languages. All our signages are in six languages. So it's not unusual to have the pharmacist from one country talking to the nurse's aide from another country who has just gotten a, a order from a doctor from another country, and everybody's translating as you go. Very, very scary stuff. And then, of course, you go back to the patient and you say, are you Mrs. So-and-so? And, you know, they don't know who, they don't have that communication either. So it's a very, very dangerous situation that we're in all the time, and we know it. That's why we knew six years ago, before meaningful use, before the feds got into this, we knew we needed to be able to be paperless. We needed to be on an electronic medical record, even though we didn't have resources. Um, I think that what we tried to do, what I tried to do, first of all, is to build a consensus of my team. Right, because it's something, this is an enormous sacrifice, this kind of an effort, because it takes resources that other people want to be spending on other things. You have to say, this is more important, we're spending it on this, and it's time. We have to be able to say that this is the most important project we're doing. And the only way you really do that is it's, it, if it is a winner for everybody. So in building the team, you have to think about what is it that a, an electronic medical record, an electronic system is going to give to each one of your team members. My, my CMO, it was pretty easy, right? The chart's always available. So the residents aren't running after the doctors to try to find the chart that the nurse has that they have off in radiology and that no one can do rounds or do anything very much with. The regulatory initiatives, having the ability to have core measures built in and reminded um, is something that was very, very important to my CMO because the reality of, of getting 800 doctors to comply uh, and to document the way that you need to document going forward. The, the other thing about, that's interesting about Lutheran is though, although we are publicly funded, about two-thirds of our admissions come from uh, private physicians. So we have a very large voluntary staff. You have a very different challenge if you have a, sal a salaried full-time staff to bring along because they, they've got to get on board. Voluntary physicians, you've got to make this something that they really want. So this, the medical officer and thinking like the medical officer was a very important part of that. Uh, the COO, who can speak for herself because she is here, was very uh, concerned about patient safety, uh, just that kind of 
chart business that we were talking about before because she's the one that are running the RCAs and looking at the cases and really understanding what's working and what's not working. A lot of focus on patient satisfaction. Um, now our reimbursement is going to be tied to it, but we've been very focused on that. We've turned around Lutheran in the marketplace that we're in uh, by focusing a great deal on patient satisfaction and things that we can do to enhance that, like being able to give uh, discharge information in a way that patients can really walk away with it and understand. Those make a huge difference in terms of satisfaction and ultimately will infect our reimbursement, obviously. Um, the nurse, obviously the chief nurse, really was very concerned about being able to get things in quickly and so on, but also in terms of all the clinical instruction that needs to go on. Uh, so much that needs, we have to make sure that we're, we're teaching patients and we have to make sure that patient teaching is done consistently. Um, that it's very difficult to make sure that the nurses are doing everything that we say they're going to do at all the shifts and to the degree that we can provide uh, structure and support to them in the way of documentation, it makes it a lot easier, obviously. So that was one of the things that they were looking forward to. And our CFO, not surprisingly, was concerned about uh, the numbers, the numbers, the numbers. Uh, but what would we do without him, right? So um, can we get complete documentation, and this is becoming more and more important, and I think with uh, uh, ICD-10 coming down the pike, it, it is impossible to do ICD-10 without an electronic medical record. I, it, I just don't think it's possible to even conceptualize the number of different things that need to be documented. Um, and unless those are documented appropriately, then obviously your whole funding is going to go haywire. And um, we're very concerned, and I think most places are, that the government's going to really use this change in uh, coding as an opportunity uh, to cut back on reimbursement, just the way they have with saying that we've upcoded, now there'll be a whole other reaction to that. So, oh, it's not specified enough. Um, and if it's not specified enough, we're going to be losing dollars, uh, which none of us can afford to do. Um, all that's true. My biggest concern five years ago, six years ago, was the competitive edge. It was clear to me that the large academic medical centers in New York were going to go with systems, perhaps the epics and whatever, um, and that if I was going to be able to recruit good residents, if I was going to be able to recruit good um, attending staff, I was going to have to be able to give them the same tools, ultimately. Uh, otherwise, I was going to be left behind. Um, and that's something that, as a community hospital, we're always fighting to keep up with the technology because if we don't have it, uh, we just get tossed aside. Getting a cardiac cath lab for us was critical seven years ago. Getting an electronic medical record, we think, is the same kind of competitive edge um, going forward. As difficult as it is to get staff to support things now, um, we really believe in five to ten years from now, they're just not going to want to work at a place that doesn't have electronic support. Um, so what was the history at Lutheran? Um, we built a lot of stuff in-house. We have a fantastic IT department, which really, I think, enabled this project. Um, I don't think uh, five, six years ago, an average hospital could have really partnered the way we did and brought as much to the development table. So we developed our own physician portal. Um, which enabled our physicians to access the various systems that we had. The systems were not totally integrated, but they could individually access these systems. It was, they could not order, but we could access results, and that's starting about 2003. So it started to build up physicians getting used to relying on an uh, electronic source of information, even when they weren't in the office. And that was a very important foundation piece in getting a group to support this and go ahead. Um, we surveyed a lot of vendors uh, to see what was available. We came out with some astounding dollars uh, for us were just way beyond anything. And I think if you look at a number of the safety net hospitals in Brooklyn right now, um, a number of them are really have huge um, debts due to loans that were taken out to try to keep up with technology. And um, we were determined not to do that. But 
it was a real challenge when we saw the dollars involved. So um, my CIO actually found that we could buy Vista with, under the Freedom of Information Act, which we did for $41.16. Um, the problem is we got the thing, and we didn't know what the heck to do with it. I mean, well, we puddled around with it for a while, but it was very clear we were not taking this and making this a product that was usable. Um, so we were very fortunate that we were able to find MedSphere. So we were down the path towards Vista before finding MedSphere, but we really needed somebody who could do the commercialization for us and with us. And that's the process that we've been in. So uh, why did we make the decision to go with Open Vista? I mean, I think that the biggest things that we've come across, uh, first of all, having the source code itself, you know, for all of you who are on a tight budget, every time a new regulation comes down and I have to deal with my vendor to ask them to please put one more field in um, the, uh, the information sheet so I can capture the thing I'm now required to capture and it's going to cost me $10,000 for them to do the evaluation and then four months to program it and on and on and on. It's, it's been an enormous drain to us in terms of resources and we've had the capability of doing it, we just haven't had the access. So having the access to the code as far as we were concerned was absolutely critical. Um, the, having the whole idea of uh, open source developing over time and being able to keep up to date with different things was very important and not really being dependent on a vendor that would be able to sort of lock us up. So we could afford this. It was a stretch. Even this is a stretch for a place like ours, but it was an investment in our future. And we invested an enormous amount of time that went along with the dollars. So we spent less dollars, but a lot of people time, a lot of people time. Um, the AMR challenges that we faced, I think it's the same thing that a lot of folks face, but we didn't really have a 24 hour support operation at that point. It was really sort of nine to five. Um, we didn't have easy sign on. This was a big deal. Uh, we had to really work on this because it was, again, it's uh, back to what we were talking about before. If it's not easy for the doctor, they're not doing it. They're just not doing it. And, you know, it's saying you can punch in this and tell them your wife's birthday and, you know, it's not working. They need to swipe in. They need to swipe out. They need to be able to make these things happen very quickly. That's what we have tried to look at this from the perspective of a physician. We have a very active physician advisory group that has been working hand in hand with us over several years. So we get the feedback from our docs, what's working, what's not working. Um, a big challenge for us was having enough equipment. Obviously, if everybody's going to be interacting with this thing, it was a, a stretch for us to be able to go out and get enough, both in terms of getting the devices and having the physical room to put the devices. Uh, you know, all of us, uh, they, it's like uh, trying to put these big TVs right into the little TV cabinets. I mean, that's, you know, our hospitals and health centers are, are all not built to accommodate the kind of technology that we have to. So we have to be really creative about thinking. Now, as things go wireless, obviously, it becomes easier and easier. But to tell you the truth, I'm in the kind of community, I'm not putting a whole lot of wireless stuff out there that people can walk out with because it won't be there. You know, I, I have my chairs bolted down in my waiting room for a reason. So uh, we're not walking around with iPads and, and giving them out willy-nilly because they, they just won't be there. Um, so it's, it's a real challenge to be able to, to do it. We've worked a lot on customizing the product so that the product is really a Lutheran product. Um, even though doctors actually have worked in the VA and have some familiarity with it, we have tried to make the language the language that they are used to as much as possible. Now, of course, we used it as a change agent. There's no sense in bringing in a system like this and merely mechanizing everything you're doing. You really have to look for the opportunity. How can you do it better? How can you do it more efficiently? How can you think? And that's hard. Um, and we spent a lot of time and money actually looking at our processes. How could we optimize the use of the system with the processes? Um, and that was something that we actually had to bring people in and help us. We don't have a lot of infrastructure, staff infrastructure, but we augmented 
um, the MedSphere folks and our folks with other people to help us with process redesign because that was essential to make it really work appropriately. Staff training is essential to success in any new product. And this was something that we have spent a lot of money and time and energy on. Uh, we've actually developed um, uh, CDs that, they can, that physicians can take home and do training online kind of stuff remotely. Um, and we developed those kinds of things so that this would be things that would be um, very helpful for the doctor to do on an easy basis. Uh, but we did require that there be at least one hour of real-time training and that everybody actually be certified before they be permitted on the system. So you could train at home, but you had to go through the testing. The rest of the staff, it was up to eight hours that they were really training. Um, we obviously don't have the staff to do that training ourselves. We had to bring in people to help us. The big cost is not the cost of paying for the trainers, but paying for the backfill. So the nurse goes off the floor, you've got to fill that position while she is being trained, and you've got your double costs. So in budgeting and being aware of what is this going to cost you, um, you know, sometimes I think it's better not to know the bottom line number and just sort of go through this blindly because if you really see what the whole thing's going to cost in the end, you just can't imagine that you're going to get there. But I do think you have to think about these kinds of investments, really. Um, the investment in training is a critical investment. And how are you going to do that on an ongoing basis? Because we all have staff turnover. You know, I get 100 new residents every year, um, and they're very tech savvy and they learn very quickly but they've got to be taught um, and there's got to be a way to do that because you know in the old days um, you know the, the guy who had the job before sort of trained you on the thing and the way they did it was the way uh, they maybe it worked and maybe it didn't and maybe the mistakes they made you made and so on you can't afford to do that anymore so you've got to invest in ongoing support so that 24 hours a day, the physicians and the nurses and everyone feel supported, and you have to invest in training. Um, and you should invest in process redesign, because then you're going to get your maximum payback for that. Although I will tell you, in my experience of almost 35 years of doing this, and I've been in every one of the system, academic medical centers that I've been in, starting with uh, NYU in 1975 when we were implementing the TDS system, which was really dates me back there, if you will, the Technicon system. Um, but it, it's always a matter of trying to bring everybody along and bring in this implementation in a way that makes some sense for the institution. You've got to buy your docs in, and you've got to make it work for the whole institution. Um, and it doesn't matter how big the place is, uh, how much money you have. The challenges are always the same challenges over and over again. Um, so what did we get? We got what we needed, to tell you the truth. We got a system that uh, has improved safety, legibility, efficiency, clinical protocols. Um, we've, we've got what we need now to make this work, and we're very excited uh, with it. Um, what we've done in terms of implementation, you know, everyone says, oh, this is really bad, and everyone fights you, and look what happened in LA. They had to take the system out, and so on. I, I think the thing is there's a way to implement these systems that you have a good chance of success and a way of making sure they're going to fail. So what are the elements of success in terms of this? Well, first of all, I think you need to go slow. Um, which, of course, is counterintuitive to what's going on with meaningful use and everybody running ahead. But you really got to think about what is your culture and where are your staff and how can you get them used to it. Our physician portal started some core number of people used to it. So we had five, six years of people thinking about a computer as something that could possibly help them in their, um, in their uh, offices and so on. Um, so what we've done is develop that group of physicians that give us feedback on an ongoing basis, and we've rolled it out in a very deliberate fashion. We started with CPOE, 
um, which obviously makes some sense. We had the report, most of them were used to getting reports. Now it was a matter of getting them to do the orders, um, and that was a whole thing. We used some systems that we had previously, and we hooked MedSphere up to that, the Vista system. The others we brought in entirely new. Uh, we tried to make it work in each area uh, as it would work best for the physicians. And I think that that's made a, a very big difference in terms of, of what's gone on. We focused a lot with the residents, obviously. We're lucky. We have residents. Residents are young. They, they just do it, and it pulls along. So do I have a group of, of old timers that really don't know how to even sign on? Yes, I do. But it's invisible to the rest of the uh, institution because we have enough people that are doing it for them. Um, meaningful use, um, the, what you need to do meaningful use, it's in the system, it's there. Uh, the, the system itself, as you know, is certified, um, and then the process you need to go through is your application needs to be certified, and that's the process we're in right now. Um, but all the elements that you need, whether it's the program, problem list or the advanced directives or the med reconciliation, it's all there in the system. Um, and it's just a matter of making it work with your organization in the right way. That's very critical, obviously. Um, so what we've done is we've um, really brought the system in in stages. The only place where we've brought in clinical documentation so far was in the ED. The ED has been a real challenge, I'll tell you that. Um, the ED is a challenge because Frankly, the VA didn't focus a whole lot on EDs uh, because that's not where they were providing a lot of care. Uh, so we've done a lot of work in uh, developing and enhancing the, uh, the original VA system. But our ED was the only place that was on using clinical documentation before we started with MedSphere. So I couldn't take away the ER system and not give them as much as they had. So the only place we've got ClinDoc going is there. We've got uh, barcode meds administration being rolled out through the institution unit by unit extremely successfully. And that was a group that I was concerned about, nurses' aides, not so techno-savvy. Sav Two years ago, we started training and making available to all of our aides and uh, associates a basic computer training. I mean, you think everybody has an iPhone, so everyone knows what they're doing. In fact, it depends on your staff and how comfortable they really are going to be typing and working with this thing. We started that a few years ago to start bringing people in so that they would do it. So the Barcode Meds Administration has been a smashing success, and everybody, the, everyone loves it. And instead of standing there, again, back to my multicultural phenomenon, right, of my uh, Russian nurse talking to my Chinese um, patient, asking them what their birth date is so I can have two sources of uh, ID, and, uh, you know, the Chinese patient turning to her daughter saying, you know, what is this crazy person saying? It, it isn't, it, it, this works much better, much better. So. Um, so um, we have not filed for meaningful use yet because we wanted to optimize the time between the first phase and the second phase, but we're starting our data collection. Um, Claudia, when do we actually start the data collection? Jen. So that was just a cheap way for me to get something to drink. But. Um, thank you. Um, I think the thing is, is that, um, you know, a lot of places are talking about meaningful use. Not so many places have actually gotten meaningful use. Um, I think if it's managed, this, we had our eyes on the prize here. We d made a decision to implement things in a particular order that list before so that we could meet the meaningful use because we need those dollars in as fast as possible. So we really are counting on being able to apply in April and get paid because those dollars are important. It's, you know, our, I'm sure like some of you, you know, our life is a little bit of a Ponzi scheme, you know, as one dollars come in and the other dollars. So um, that's what I sort of feel like in terms of managing these days. But. Um, so what do you need to make it happen? What, what makes it successful? And I have to say I think it's been successful. I think it's been tough. If you think it's going to be easy, um, forget it. 
And I, I would say this, even if you've got a bazillion dollars and you're going to get some Cadillac system and all this kind of stuff, it's still very hard work. It's change. There's nothing more scary to your staff than change um, and what that means to each one of them individually. And this is life changing. You know, things are happening so fast around us. I don't think we fully appreciate how slow organizations are to change. You know, every, every six months there's a new iPhone um, that everybody's out on. But, you know, I still have a lot of doctors who come in at, uh, you know, 7.30 in the morning and scribble on their charts and go back to their offices and see some pay. A lot has not changed. A lot has not changed. This is radical. So you've got to get the institution, you've got to realize that that's what you're talking about and that you're talking about a sacrifice on everyone's part. Um, it's hard to learn new things, it's hard to do things, and it's great to tell everybody in the end it's going to be better. But you got to get to that place. So h giving everybody something that they want out of this is very important. It was very important to us that we identify a group of medical staff leadership that could deliver this for the rest of the staff. They became winners. It became theirs to deliver. And they were able to make sure administration did this and that and really was responsive. You know, let them win because it's important that you get them on your team, obviously. Um, so I think that there's no question the organization needs to be ready. You got to really figure out what it's going to cost you to do this thing. Um, and don't underestimate it. It just takes lots to do. Even if you have a fabulous development staff like we have that's been a, done a lot of work um, and done a lot of enhancements, it just costs a lot of money. Um, but this isn't a choice. You're sitting here, you can make a choice what you're going to do. The choice of if you're going to do this or not is over. Um, you know, five, six years ago when we were making this choice, there were those that argued with me, you didn't need to be in the front of the pack, don't do it. Thank goodness we did it when we did. Thank goodness. Because the idea of getting online and first starting this process or first starting to get the organization ready and going um, would be terrifying because we really live sort of day to day where we are and this is very important. Um, Communication. We had Elmer. Elmer is that is that his name? Elmer the uh, wizard. El, yeah, whatever. Yeah, Elmar, whatever. Anyway, the point is, um, we had uh, this guy, this campaign guy, and he's all over the place. And there are like little wizard notes that pop up all during the day, and all this kind of stuff. Um, we really put a whole communication plan together. Um, and it's, it's a challenge for us because we're in so many different places and we have multiple systems. Uh, so there still are s other systems that are out there and how they're going to integrate together is very much a challenge. But communicate, you can't tell people too many things. You just can't. They may not show up, they may not care about the meeting, you got to have the meeting, you got to have the briefing, you got to give them dinner if it's doctors because they like dinner. Um, and you just have to keep giving the message out over and over again. I, I'm sure we had, we got t-shirts, right, didn't we? At some point there were t-shirts, I remember, and all kinds of stuff. Uh, I survived, you know, Elmer's, whatever it was, 210. Um, and I think there needs to be commitment from the top. Um, I chaired some of the steering committee for a period of time when things were rocky myself. Um, and I did that because everyone had to know how important this was. The medical staff had to know how important it was. The nursing staff had to know how important it was. The administrative staff, everyone had to realize. And if the president of the system was spending an hour a week arguing about this stuff, then indeed it was important. Um, I realize not everyone can get that kind of commitment, but you've got to make sure that people are lined up because it's not going to go smoothly. It's just not. By definition, there are going to be bumps in the road. But if you've got your team lined up with reasonable expectations and adequate resources, there's a system here that can make it happen. It can put it within the grasp of a lot of places that this was really far beyond the grasp of. And that's the very exciting thing to me about VISTA, is that it really gives it to people like us. 
We believe that safety net institutions make a difference in people live. We believe we deserve the tools to do that. Uh, this country is very much divided between the have and the have nots. And I've been very fortunate in my career to work for a lot of haves. But now that I'm working at the have nots, I'm very grateful to have a partner like MedSphere to face what we do. So, um, and then I think this is Steve's thing. Oh, da -da, same thing, right, right. Oh, and here it is, right? Don't forget to enjoy the ride. So, <laughs> there you go.